Well, yes, I think there is an, a, a canon of Australian literature, but I think it's not so much a thing as a process, a process of ongoing debate and argument that unfolds across generations. And when we teach it, we should be teaching that process of debate. And of course, the new anthology will be an important intervention in that ongoing debate. Let me just give you a couple of examples. In the 1920s, for example, one of the major debates around the canon was the issue of whether writers should be nationally minded or cosmopolitan or international. And Miles Franklin had very strong views on that and tended to exclude people like Christina Stead and Henry Handel Richardson, whom today are integral to the canon. In the 1960s and 70s, when Patrick White was at, his, at, at the peak of his reputation, intervening in Australian literature, he sought to do away with what he called dun-coloured journalistic realism. And so there was an argument between canons of realistic, realist writing and uh, more modernist uh, writing. In the 70s, of course, the central argument was about the recuperation of women writers and, and a whole new series of writers flooded into the canon. And most recently, it's opened quite spectacularly in the 2000s to include indigenous writers who are now absolutely central to the canon, people like Alexis Wright uh, and Kim Scott. So yes, it's, it's a, a process. The canon, because it involves contestation, has always marginalised and left things off. Um, many of the great women writers of the 19th century, for example, were not read for many years in the early 20th century. Uh, Catherine Helen Spence, for example. Um, one of the earliest histories of Australian literature, which was H.M. Green's in 1961, essentially did very short justice to Christina Stead because he saw her as a cosmopolitan writer and therefore saw no point in referring to her works in any great detail. Uh, at different times, genres like popular fiction, or as we would say today, genre fiction, have been marginalised. One of the biggest selling novels, for example, of the 19th century was Fergus Hume's Mystery of a Handsome Cab, which for many years was, was not part of the canon, and probably still isn't. Um, uh, some, some novels have had to fight their way into popular acceptance through being so scandalous. I mean, um, the, uh, a good example is Catherine Susanna Pritchard's Coon Adu, which when it appeared in, in serial form in 1928, uh, caused a scandal because it showed sexual relations between white pastoralists and indigenous women. I'd like to think of the anthology as a device that contributes to our public memory and the way we preserve the literature. We need only think of Nettie Palmer writing in the 1920s when we didn't have such devices of public memory. And Nettie Palmer was genuinely concerned that for the future, our memory of the literature would disappear. And she argued that without things like anthologies and bibliographies and books of criticism and review, future generations of readers would not have access to the literature. So I think for that reason, Australian literature always needs its advocacy, it always needs to be defended and it needs to be promoted. And I think we need to see ourselves not just as critics of the literature, but as curators in the sense that an art gallery curator is someone who promotes the, their work, the work in the public sphere. Uh, and so I, I would hope to see the anthology as contributing to that role of keeping Australian literature in the public memory for the future, whatever form that may take. Every anthology, because it is of its time, has to make a statement about what, what the canon is at that time. But it needs to do so in the light of the fact that the future will be different and that other voices will need to be incorporated, that other debates will unfold and that the canon will change. That's its nature, that it will change for the future.